Hey guys, welcome back to Rumorg TV. Executive Editor Andrea Subasati here to remind you about our new tier of subscribers to Rumorg Magazine. Our deluxe subscription is now available. And the deluxe subscription not only gets you every issue of Rumorg delivered straight to your door, but it also entitles you to access the digital edition and the entire back issue archive of the magazine online. That's over 200 editions and counting from 1997 all the way to present day. All that comes in a deluxe subscription. So check that link below, enjoy this episode, and we'll see you next time. Hi everyone, welcome back to Sympathy for the Sequel. I'm Alex West, co-host of the Faculty of Horror podcast, author and contributor to Rue Morgue magazine. What we do in this segment is we have a look at major horror franchises, go over to Rotten Tomatoes and see what is the lowest rated entry in that franchise? And we try to figure out why and look at the production history, the reception history, and we try to find at least a few good things about it and give it a bit of a reappraisal. So today we are going down south. We are tackling the Texas Chainsaw Massacre franchise. Today, we are talking about the iconic Texas Chainsaw Massacre franchise. Uh, it is what I would call a nebulous franchise. There's very few straight lines. It is, you know, there was the original trajectory and then there was remakes and reboots and requels and all kinds of reimaginings that are still going on and released to this day. And there's probably even more to come. And Frankly, I have a bit of a problem like keeping track of them all. So when I went back to Rotten Tomatoes to look at all the scores, I was like, wow, look at this entire franchise of films that I only have a vague, vague knowledge of. But for our purposes today, the lowest rated entry in the Texas Chainsaw Massacre franchise is... The Texas Chainsaw Massacre, The Beginning. you did, boy. You started a whole whirlwind. Mark Sablov of the Austin Chronicle writes, it's neither as bad as it could have been nor as interesting as it should have been. And the final dulcetary reaction is a decidedly minor one. Randy Cordova of the Arizona Republic writes, gross and sadistic, but never scary. So we have to start this story in 1974 when the original film by Toby Hooper came out. This film is iconic, it is classic, it's not just a masterpiece of a horror film, it's a masterpiece of a film. And that's because it spoke to so many American and Western anxieties from class disparity to the Vietnam War and so many others. And it did so in this sun-drenched, gothic South setting. It has so much implied violence that oftentimes as an audience member, you're filling in the gaps of what happens. And it's a pretty incredible feat of filmmaking. <laughs> Smash cut to 2004 and Michael Bay's Platinum Dunes releases the Texas Chainsaw Massacre remake. And from there, we get kind of a remake feeding frenzy. It does incredibly well, I think better than anyone expected it to. So they decided that this should be an ongoing thing. They should make more of them. So that original 2004 remake, it's not bad, but it really leans into the gore of the torture porn subgenre that was emerging at the time. It has a real like naughty oddies aesthetic. It just doesn't really have any of the insights or grit of the original film, but hey, it did real well. So you know what that means. Sequels, or in this case, a prequel. Oh my God, I'm gonna make a soldier out of you yet. <laughs> And that is because two producers of the film, Andrew Form and Brad Fuller, apparently constantly had fans coming up to them and saying, ah, oh, ah, oh, Mr. Fuller, Mr. Form, how, how did that character become a cop in the 2004 film? How did that other character lose their legs? Why did this happen? 
And they were like, well, you know what? We weren't going to make a prequel or sequel or anything. We were just going to be regular Hollywood producers quietly sitting on our piles of money and just like, just count it. But now, now the fans, the fans have demanded answers and we shall give them answers. Now, I'm not saying that theory is complete bullshit, but I have a really fun story to tell all of you guys out there. I was walking to come record this segment today and uh, Paul Rudd and Chris Evans stopped me on the street and they were like, Alex, you are so beautiful and so cool and your Room Lord TV segment is the best and we just hope you do it forever. And uh, we would love to both date you at the same time. And I was like, Phew. Okay, Paul and Chris, I guess that's, that's, anyway, that's how I got boyfriends. So to get into this 2006, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, the beginning prequel fan film that these producers benevolently made. It takes place, uh, again, a few years before the 2004 film, and it follows two brothers who are about to be shipped out to Vietnam to fight in the war. And they are on a big road trip across Texas with their girlfriends, and oh no, they run afoul of a cannibalistic family. But in this timeline, they're the Hewitt family, not the Sawyer family, so sure. Fine. Then it's just a big old cat and mouse game for the rest of the movie for a very long time, for a very, very long time that this film goes on for. Um, and yeah, that's, that's it. That's basically it. And it sets up all of the, like, again, fan questions that this film kind of apes on. And the biggest issue with this film is its complete lack of tension. Ultimately, the narrative thrust is just jumping from one Easter egg to another to answer these kind of bizarro fan questions about a cannibalistic family that I'm not sure they ever really asked for. This is your lucky day. How would you like to just stand right up here today and just walk right on out of here, huh? I'd like that, Sheriff. Yeah, well, freedom ain't free. You know that, right? I'll tell you what, 10 push-ups stand between you and freedom here today. And then on top of that, this film is just dripping in gore. It has none of the implied violence of the original film, and I think it kind of even makes the 2004 film look a little like PG, because there is a lot of blood and guts and things being ripped out of people and put on people and all kinds of weird stuff happening. And in doing so, the film is just money shots. It's just endless money shots, and it just becomes so exhausting. So looking back at this period in the aughts, it's I think ultimately a really big missed opportunity that these films didn't set them in the then present day. They kept the setting in the 1970s like the original film which was then set in the present day of 1974. But you kind of lose a lot of the opportunities that that era could have provided you. You know, in the 70s, you had the Vietnam War. In the naughty oddies, we had the War on Terror. Uh, in the 70s, it was Nixon. In the 2000s, it was Bush. There were so many parallels. And I get that they were, you know, kind of not maybe wanting to make a huge political commentary at that time. But what is horror if not a great social commentating apparatus? I truly think it is at its best. And this film just kind of feels like that grindhouse, uh, you know, 90s filmmaker aesthetic of this idealized, sexy version that's also kind of gross of the 70s. And it's, you know, it's just not as interesting or as entertaining or as political as it could have been. You're not a soldier. You hold a gun like a fucking girl. Get out of my way. You're not a candy ass, are you, Sheriff? Motherfucking trigger! I ain't finished with you yet. So, let's talk good things. Really struggled with these. <laughs> <laughs> the gore. Okay, I know what you're saying, Alex. You were just, like, bitching about the gore. But, I will say, some of the gore is bitching. 
In fact, all of the gore is bitching. It looks really good. Uh, I watched it on a very high def TV and it still looked really good. And if you're gonna have a gore saturated film, it might as well be like, you know, blood dripping and you feel the kind of like texture of it and you feel things like just being ripped out and cut open. And I mean, if you're gonna do it, they did it well. And I appreciate that. And the other thing I thought was genuinely great in this film was Jordana Brewster. She plays Chrissy, our de facto final girl in this film. And like many other great final girls of the 2000s, she is resplendent in her white tank top that proceeds to get more and more dirty throughout the film. But she is really, really good in this film. She uh, plays Chrissy like she's an actual human being who is actually in a world. And when she is absent from the film for various segments, you really miss her because I feel like she really grounds the film in some kind of humanity. And you actually kind of care about her, which I didn't care about many characters in this film. People may not know what we say here tonight. By God, they'll remember what we did. So that is our sympathy for the sequel episode on the Texas Chainsaw Massacre franchise. I really hope you enjoyed it. Please let us know in the comments below what your favorite entry in this bizarro Texas Chainsaw Massacre franchise is. I feel like this franchise kind of got stuck in that uh, aping of the 70s aesthetic and it kind of ignores all the weirdness that happens in those original set of sequels. Like, you know what, frankly, I would rather watch Matthew McConaughey torture Renee Zellweger than see another iteration of a 70s grindhouse thing. Let me ask you one question. Are you having fun here? Oh, God. <laughs> because I promise you, <laughs> I promise you, you and I are going to have some fun. Oh, no, no, more, please. Drop us a comment below and let us know what you think. And while you're there, please like and subscribe to this video. So until the next time you need to get your white tank top professionally cleaned, we'll see you in the sequel. Bring it home, friends. Clap it, clap it up. Yeah. I'll just do one, I won't be nasty. <laughs> I'm sure fine will help you. Will it? We'll be like, I can line them all up in a row.